Hello, Paul Osborne here with a little bonus podcast. It's a trawl through the archive. Think of it as being a bit like Simon Bates' Golden Hour on Radio 1 years ago, only with considerably less Spandau Ballet. If you're looking, by the way, for our most recent episode, it should be just below this one in your podcast feed. But this look back is because it is exactly a year since the snap general election that plunged us into the uncertainty, vitriol and semi-permanent state of crisis that we live through today. And I'm sure that, like me, you'd like nothing more than to spend 15 or 20 minutes reliving the whole thing. So come with me, why don't you, as we look through the 10 election podcasts we put out during the campaign. The snap election was called the day after Easter Monday, when journalists were summoned to Downing Street for an unexpected announcement. Now, just a few days before that, I'd been complaining about the never-ending cascade of voting. Here's what we said at the start of last week's podcast. Do you ever get the feeling that we spend too much of our time voting? In the last year, we've had elections to the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, the London Assembly, plus choosing a new mayor in London, and there was, you know, the EU referendum. Now, look, I like an election as much as the next man, assuming the next man is a political obsessive who reads books about elections for his own amusement. But even I think this is getting a little bit over the top. But it turns out the real problem is that we just haven't been having enough elections. Division in Westminster will risk our ability to make a success of Brexit and it will cause damaging uncertainty and instability to the country. So we need a general election and we need one now. If we believe the Prime Minister, there's no reason to disbelieve her, she reluctantly came to the conclusion that a general election was the only way forward while on an Easter walking holiday in Wales, that it's all because of the continued political division over Brexit. It is absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the Conservatives have a crushing opinion poll lead and are probably going to eviscerate the Labour Party. You'd be a fool and a communist to suggest otherwise. I think the fact that of the 20% Tory lead was probably more prominently in her brain as she was enjoying her uh, walking holiday with her beloved. On the one hand, this has all the makings of being as boring an election as 2001 when we knew from the very beginning that Labour was going to win with a thumping big majority and that the Tories were going to get crushed. We kind of feel right now that obviously this is going to end with a massive Tory majority with the Labour Party in pieces. But we've been through an awful lot of elections and referendums and heaven knows what in the last few years, and we've had an awful lot of surprises. I am not for one moment suggesting that Jeremy Corbyn will be standing on the steps of 10 Downing Street the day after this general election. I am, however, suggesting those people who are predicting a Tory majority of 170 or 180 are a little bit over the top. It was hard to imagine any other outcome at that stage. Within days, though, it seemed the Prime Minister was stuck on repeat. The Maybot was starting to malfunction. Here we are at the end of week one of the campaign, and there's something I'm just not very clear about. Who can we rely on in these troubled times to provide strong and stable leadership? I would like to take a strong and stable hold of a stick and use it to beat politicians who say the same thing over and over again. Though, to be honest, this is actually your fault. Politicians aren't stupid, regardless of how much evidence to the contrary they may provide. And they are well aware that most normal people are not really paying that much attention to this campaign. So they come up with a winning phrase, say, for example, strong and stable leadership. And then they repeat it over and over and over again in the hope that it might crowbar its way into voters' heads by polling day. You're just trying to get some vigour and excitement and a state of urgency into the campaign. They just they want to make sure that their vote and their potential new vote comes out on June the 8th. The most recent campaign video that she's put out on Twitter ends with a massive caption that has Theresa May in big, huge letters and then Conservative down the bottom in tiny little letters, (laughs) almost as if in places like the north of England, the Midlands, South Wales, Conservative is a kind of relatively toxic brand. Now, this election was a surprise to everyone. The Cabinet, journalists of Westminster and perfectly innocent political commentators who suddenly found themselves having to record podcasts in the back of a van on the other side of the world. Normally, this podcast comes to you via London and the North. But for the next couple of weeks, it will be coming from the Northern and Southern 
hemispheres. Now, this is because I rather foolishly assumed, like most of us, that when Theresa May repeatedly said there would not be a snap election, that she was telling the truth. I even booked flights to Australia saying it's not as if there's going to be a snap election. But don't worry, dear listener, because I'm going to spend my holiday obsessively keeping up with the general election campaign just so that you don't have to. There does seem to be a bit of a personality cult developing around Theresa May, which, when you consider that she doesn't really have that much of a personality, is rather surprising. She is about as uncomfortable around ordinary people as any politician could be, which is presumably why they're doing everything they can to make certain that she doesn't actually come across that many ordinary people during the course of the campaign. And the good news, kids, is this is going to go on for another month. (laughs) Isn't that exciting? It was around here that the campaign started to move away from the script we were expecting it to follow. When Labour's manifesto was leaked to the press, leaked, by the way, quite possibly by someone at the top of the Labour Party, the public reaction was far more positive than many had expected. Something was going on. Paul Osborne here, calling in this week from Brisbane, where, believe it or not, Jeremy Corbyn actually made the news this week. Yes, even on the other side of the world, the Labour leader is kind of fascinating. To political reporters. What propelled him to Australian TV news was the party's campaign launch. Glitz, glamour and excitement. All of them were missing. Jeremy Corbyn is doing everything that's on the tin, essentially, the, of the Corbyn brand. I mean, it, it would be pretty remarkable and also hypocritical if he didn't go out all guns blazing with these things, if he didn't talk about renationalising the railways, the post office, that's what he very much believes in as a politician. I don't, he's, he's not sort of hedging his bets. You wouldn't expect him to. Why not? Why not go for it when, in fact, you know damn well you're not going to be moving into Downing Street on the 9th of June. So the Labour manifesto went down rather well. And then a few days later, the Tory manifesto was out and seemed to be specifically designed to alienate as many of the party his own supporters as possible. Now look, hands up, who has ever read a manifesto? One of you must have done, surely. It can't just be me. Manifestos are actually really handy if you ever find yourself struck by sudden insomnia. And thanks to today's modern internet, you don't even have to be judged by people in WH Smith to get hold of one. This week, we have had the formal publication of the Conservative Party's plans for the next five years. This is very obviously the manifesto of a party that is pretty confident of winning, pretty confident of winning very well, and taking advantage of that to force through all manner of things that normally it wouldn't dare do with the sort of tiny majority that the Conservatives had after the last general election, like, for example, robbing free lunches off infant school pupils. It is also, with respect, a little bit rich for a party that's been in power for seven years to suddenly turn around and say, good God, there's some sort of social care funding crisis, and then try to seek the credit for solving it. A lot more homes are going to end up being sold, albeit eventually to fund that social care. That's not terribly helpful if you don't own your own home, like, for example, the entire coming generation who've been priced out of the housing market. It doesn't seem a convincing argument. Again, it just seems a fudge when it comes to dealing with a problem that I think is going to really become a massive issue uh, for governments over the next uh, you know, two decades, when I think, you know, as I say, when the baby boom generation are of a very elderly age, there's, they're going to be in very, very big number. They are willing to bring in things that will specifically harm the old Older voters who are absolutely their base. More of those older voters will have to surrender at least part of the value of their home to fund care towards the end of their lives. The triple lock on pensions is going to be scrapped. Now, again, pensions have risen far above average earnings in recent years. It is arguably fair to do that. But in any normal election, it would be political suicide to do that. Perhaps was the moment when the wheels really did fall off Theresa May's campaign. We'd already been seeing her stilted performances, but now it looked like the party was gunning for its own natural supporters. Within days, a hasty handbrake turn was announced. Robert, to believe the idea that this 
isn't a U-turn. You have to accept that the Tories had always planned to put a cap on the total care costs and just forgot to put it in the manifesto. And it would be fine if Jeremy Hunt hadn't explicitly said that the party was abandoning the idea of the cap. So what's happened here is the Tories were so spooked by the bad reaction the plan got and perhaps felt a little bit overconfident about just how much they could get away with in this election and how much they could take the loyalty of the pensioner vote for granted. Yes, the Tories have been caught out. It was it was a rather cynical political strategy at this point. I think if we look to the longer term, this issue will have to be, have to be addressed. I suppose the problem is that it's the Conservative Party who for decades have promoted property ownership as the thing to aspire to. Work hard, pay your mortgage, own your own home, own an asset that is wealth that will appreciate in value that you can hand on to your children. I think it was Margaret Thatcher who came up with that idea of you know wealth cascading down the generations and it feels a bit like that bargain has just been torn up you've spent decades telling people that if they work hard and they pay their mortgage they will have this huge asset to hand on to their children and then you suddenly say to them actually no we're going to take it back but while it's true the tory campaign was not going as well as expected and labor's was going a lot better the poll still pointed to a significant Conservative majority come June the 8th. What on earth is happening? Could we be about to see a general election in which Theresa May will win, but see her reputation badly dinted, while Jeremy Corbyn will lose, but find himself in a stronger position? Well, let's explore that now with Robert Meakin. Robert, Jeremy Corbyn was barely on speaking terms with most of his own MPs in the last parliament, but I have never seen him as relaxed and confident since he became Labour leader as he has been in the last couple of weeks. He looks very comfortable in his own skin. He loves being out on the campaign trail a hell of a lot more than he you know, likes being in the House of Commons. And I think he's really come into his own. I think his, uh, the way he's campaigned, I think, is deserving of credit, particularly when you compare it to the far more uptight, pre-scripted approach of his Tory opponent. And the contrast with Theresa May is extraordinary. This sort of personality cult that she did, tried to develop at the beginning does seem to be rubbing a few Tory voters up the wrong way. Added to the fact that for somebody who has said over and over again how much they're like engaging with ordinary voters, she's actually really, really bad at it. She's stilted and awkward and uncomfortable and just not good with people. When she responds to the media, it's in, again, sort of prepared sound bites, the way she responds. She doesn't seem able to think out the box. Now, none of this is a big surprise. This is what the Tory party voted for for leader. This is what they bought into. They thought she was a straight bat, a relatively dull person, dare I say, but was a safe pair of hands who wouldn't mess things up at this very crucial, messy time in British politics. Polling day approached, and still the odds pointed to that Tory win. At least this election hadn't been as dull as we had feared at the start. Occasionally, we even came across some rather, well, entertaining candidates. We talked about Aidan Powelsland. Now, he was UKIP's candidate in South Suffolk, a man who is pinning his hopes for economic revival post-Brexit on interstellar travel and mining the asteroid belt. Pretty far out. Then we met this guy. Hello, my name's Greg Knight. I'm the Conservative candidate for East Yorkshire. There's a general election on the 8th of June. Now, Sir Greg Knight does not have the most convincing delivery. I'll give you that. But who else has this? You'll get accountability with Conservative delivery. Make sure this time you get it right. Vote for Greg Knight. I need to make clear, this is in no way an endorsement of Sir Greg Knight's campaign. There are five other candidates in his constituency, but come on! Who doesn't want an MP who has his own jingle? And come to think of it, why don't more politicians have their own jingles? They could be played as they come on stage or as they stand up at the dispatch box. Imagine what Jeremy Corbyn's jingle would sound like. Seriously, imagine it. If it was a week to polling day rather than a day, I'd make this a competition. I'd go out to the shops and buy a prize to induce you to write a winning jingle. If local DJs at stations with names like 107.6 The Spud 
can have their own jingle, why the hell can't politicians? Sadly, my dream of jingles for politicians remains just that. And so we arrive at the 8th of June 2017, polling day. Now, I spent election night in a BBC studio where just before we went on air, we were betting on the likely outcome. Every single one of us still expected a Conservative win. The lowest majority anyone predicted was around 40. Once again, like Brexit and Donald Trump, our soothsaying abilities were less than perfect. It is clear that only the Conservative and Unionist Party has the legitimacy and ability to provide that certainty by commanding a majority in the House of Commons. The Prime Minister called the election because she wanted a mandate. Well, the mandate she's got is lost Conservative seats, lost votes, lost support and lost confidence. I would have thought that's enough to go, actually. Theresa May promised strong and stable leadership. She has brought weakness and uncertainty. If she has an ounce of self-respect, she will resign. Welcome, then, to the election that nobody won. Certainly not the Conservatives, who lost their narrow majority and are now scrabbling around for partners like a drunk at the end of a disco. Uh, Theresa May did, after all, warn us of the risks of a coalition of chaos, a government propped up by Northern Ireland politicians with questionable extremist views. The only bit she left out was that she would be trying to run it. And while the Tories had an awful night, you would never have guessed it from her speech in Downing Street on Friday. Another stilted, pre-prepared statement seemingly meant for a landslide victory that made no reference at all to the way her gamble had backfired spectacularly. Well, that prompted so much fury from her own side that she was forced within hours to record a far more contrite interview where she finally did manage to apologise to the Tory MPs and activists that she had just led off the edge of a cliff. Robert, let's go back to 10 o'clock Thursday night. The exit poll pops up. I thought I'd misread it. I thought my eyesight was failing. It couldn't possibly say that the Conservatives were going to lose seats and lose their majority. And not only did it say that, but it turned out to be absolutely spot on. I thought, you know, going into it, that the absolute extreme but unlikely, you know, worst case scenario for Theresa May and the Tories would be a hung parliament. But that seemed to be drifting into the realms of never, never land, really. It's surely, surely they couldn't perform that badly. So, you know, it, it was a staggering, remarkable turnaround. This was a highly personal campaign based entirely around Theresa May. And therefore, it is a highly personal disaster in which nobody else is to blame. You cannot blame even a single other member of the cabinet for this because they weren't allowed out. It's like they've been locked in a box. She seemed to think that her personality would help the Tories to this massive victory, when in fact it turned out that the more the voters saw of Theresa May, the less they liked her. I mean, we always knew she was a, a poor, you know, rather stilted campaigner. That was nothing new. But under the under the spotlight relentlessly and during a, an election campaign, all that really came to the fore. It just became clear just how lousy she was as an operator, as a performer. Labour didn't win this election. They lost for the third time in a row. But at a time that we thought they would drop below 200 seats, they gained 30 seats in a way that I don't think any of the people around Jeremy Corbyn, up to and including the Labour leader themselves, imagined was possible. No, he's performed better than Ed Miliband. He's performed better than Gordon Brown. Corbyn has, has proved just to be this most remarkable politician. Little did we know that the juggernaut of Theresa May was in fact a reliant Robin with a buggered axle. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So here we are, one year on, and she's still there. Yes, Brexit still stumbles from one disaster to another. The government seems paralysed with fear and division. Theresa May has seen more ministers forced to resign than any prime minister really ought to in 12 months. But she's clung on far longer than many of us would have expected this time last year. And that doesn't, of course, mean that she's going to last all the way to the next scheduled election in 2022. Well, whatever happens, we'll be popping up to try to make sense of it. But uh, that wraps up this look back. Thanks for joining me for it. And don't forget, a rating or review on Apple Podcasts will always be hugely appreciated, he said, while gracelessly begging. We'll be back with another episode soon, but until then, goodbye. Goodbye.